We have quite a, a shift in terms of topic and, uh, and presentation, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. She is the CEO of the education media and technology company Cricket Media, which many of you will know. Uh, she provides, or they provide, award-winning digital content on a safe and secure global, ne global network to connect kids around the world. Her background is in organizational strategy and management and marketing, and she is also author of the highly regarded Robin Hood Marketing, Stealing Corporate Savvy to Sell Just Causes. Please join me in welcoming Katja Andreessen. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm acutely aware of the fact that I'm your last stop before lunch, so I thought I'd start with sort of an interactive activity. Um, and I want to get a sense from you all in the room of where you come down, sort of as an optimist, a pessimist, or sort of a cynic, um, regarding the potential for digital um, and the online world and what it will do for the next generation. Okay, so we're just going to have a little activity here where I'm going to ask you to sort of vote on your perspective. So the first camp is the good for us camp. So if you believe the next generation is going to be better for digital technology, and maybe you feel it builds knowledge or grows connections among us or could even revolutionize learning, vote for that by raising your hand. Oh, look at all this optimist. Fabulous. Okay. And I'm curious too, among the under 18 set in this room, I'm going to ask you to, I want to see where you come down. How many of you are in that camp? Okay. All right. That's Danish. <laughs> uh, my Danish is very rusty. Um, second uh, would be sort of not so much a force for good. So, you know, if you feel that our sort of text messaging, iPhone wielding cells are losing our ability to focus, we're losing track of what matters, we're becoming increasingly isolated, and we're just sort of becoming increasingly distracted. Vote in that category. <laughs> you can vote more than once too, by the way. <laughs> okay. All right, now let's have the sort of cynics among us who feel that humans are humans and technology doesn't change human nature and sort of we are who we are and this isn't going to make a big difference in our lives really in the grand scheme of things. Anyone in that camp? Okay. All right, you're probably wondering why I have a cat picture in here. Um, one reason it's almost lunch and people love cat pictures. Um, the other reason is there was a wonderful thread on Reddit a while back that I really liked. And someone posed the question, you know, what do we think is the most sort of amazing technological innovation of the last 50 years? And if you put someone in a time machine 50 years ago and you told them to come to the present moment and you set the time machine and boom, they're here now, what would be most shocking to them? Would it be the revolution in medicine? Uh, would it be space travel, right? And my favorite response was the following, and I paraphrase a little bit. The most surprising thing would be we hold the entirety of human knowledge on a single device in our hands, and we can instantly communicate with anyone in the world. And we use it to look at cat pictures and argue with strangers. <laughs> um, so I, I can understand the cynical view, too. And it's true, we don't always use digital technology for acts of staggering genius, but we could. Um, there's a book I really love by Clay Shirky that he wrote a number of years ago um, called C Cognitive Surplus. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he celebrated the potential of technology to accelerate a shift from consumption, like passive consumption, uh, to creative endeavors, which could really unleash unprecedented collaboration and positive social change. And that's what I'm really rooting for. <laughs> that's what I want to talk about today. Where I come down on technologies, I'm actually in all three camps, like I suspect some of you are. Um, it's really not so much the technology about how we use it. It can do very little that's good, or it can do many things that are good. Uh, it can change things for the better or the worse, and that includes childhood and learning and our future. So technology is really, at its essence, just a delivery system. Um, Adam Gopnik, another favorite writer of mine, compares uh, technology to toast, which is why you're looking at a picture of toast. He says, our thoughts are bigger than the things that deliver them. 
Toast, as every breakfaster knows, isn't really about the quality of the bread or how it's sliced or the toaster. For a man, and I'd add woman, cannot live by toast alone. It's about the butter. What he means is the content of our ideas, the butter, is far more valuable and important than the delivery system, which is the technology. And I think that's exactly right. Technology can give rein to our darkest instincts, and, but it can also be a delivery system for amazing things, including our best thoughts, our best efforts, how we learn, and what we set out to do together. So that's what I want to talk about is, what are the things we need to do to make good butter? What are the things we need to do to use the delivery system of technology in a way that enables not just consumption, because we're very concerned about protecting younger people who are using technology, but that it's really a way to encourage creativity, engagement, collaboration. So I think the first thing is to embrace the biggest shift I've seen in my career with digital um, over the last 15 years, which is this incredible movement from technology as being a means of mass communication to it becoming the realm of masses of communicators. And that's the most wonderful and scary essence of the transformation of the last decade in my mind. Um, and this is actually a journalism class, which I love this picture. It's incredibly meta, right? It looks, it's like one of those infinite mirrors, right? You have someone lecturing, and then you have students taking notes or maybe responding to that, or maybe they're creating their own platforms, and maybe they're blogging, and then that's re causing other people to create something, and it goes on and on. And that masses of communicators, and I'd say masses of creators, is what holds the greatest potential in my mind. And at least to my first point, which is that we have to let kids use technology to create, and they want to. What's really interesting is if you map the typical use of social media communities, the vast majority of adults are passively consuming content. So only a small percentage of us are meaningfully, actively interacting, and then a fraction of that group are actually creators. And what I mean by a creator is someone who's making something online, whether it's blogging, you know, making videos, starting communities, etc. But kids are far less hesitant to use technology to make things, online or off. They're play playful, curious, creative, and they're unafraid to make something new to share. And their natural inclination is to take a digital tool and use it to build something. And you just need to look at how kids use Minecraft as an example of that, or you can see how my teenage girls use Snapchat stories. Uh, they are creating an online world that is not something that they're using to passively entertain themselves and their friends, but also to engage them. You know, at my company, Cricket Media, which you heard about a little bit in the introduction, we like to say it's not enough just to tell stories. We have to find a way to help kids use digital technology to make their own stories. And we need to provide a platform for that. It's not just about publishing poetry, it's about hosting a poetry slam, for example. And you know, this is where kids are a bunch of steps ahead of us. And they're really using tools not just to say, look at me, right? But to say, look at what I made which is a wonderful and profound shift. And I think we must celebrate that. And it's really on us to find safe ways to make that happen. We ha and we really do have to make it happen. I think our job is to make the rules that allow kids to rule their online spaces in this act of creation. The second hope I have that I think that will really turn digital technology into force for good is about kids in collaboration. So as many of us sort of struggle with our Google Docs, you know, myself included, um, kids very naturally use technology to collaborate and co-create, not just communicate. You know, I've watched my own children, uh, they like to use FaceTime next to Minecraft or FaceTime next to uh, Quizlet, um, so that they're in an act of collaboration at the very time that they're using technology. And so look at me becomes create with me. Uh, at Cricket, we've done a little bit of that with an experiment called Crowd Sorcery, which was creating stories together. Um, it's really magical to watch this. Now, of course, as this happens, it's our role not only to give kids spaces for open uh, collaboration, but also to mentor and guide them through that. Um, and I do want to say one really interesting thing about this. So there's been a lot of talk about 
technology as being something that isolates people or reduces empathy. And I'll say that um, while there is preliminary evidence of that for kids who spend more time online, when collaborative spaces are used to open a child's world to more diversity and culture, so rich collaboration, whether it's sort of a poetry slam or an international classroom exchange, with the right guidance, rather than a loss in empathy, their understanding respect for other people and cultures can grow. So it actually boosts empathy, which again is back to my theme for how we can turn this into a force for good. And I would say we really need a lot of that in the world right now. Collaborative spaces and tools give kids the idea that the world is something they can shape, a reality over which they have some control. And this is great power, and with that power comes great responsibility. And so for kids who are developing in a lot of ways, it's our work to develop ethically sound, you know, research-backed experiences that turn this collaboration into positive learning. And the, the last and third point I want to make is that kids can really not only use digital technology as a means to learn, but also to teach. And that's another place where I feel like they're quite a bit ahead of us. Um, and in fact, what we see over and over again is kids are using technology in what's actually an effective learning cycle. So first they try something on their own, which is sort of the first step in a, in a learning cycle. Maybe through solo activities and trial and error and practicing and failing. And then once a kid starts to achieve mastery, they want to show and teach others what they have learned. When this is done within a community, it starts a really interesting feedback loop where learning, mastery, and sharing, and collective growth can happen. You can see this in everything from uh, gaming communities to the fact that I have another child that learned how to play guitar online from other kids playing guitar online. We can learn a lot about how kids communicate with each other to spark innovation in the digital educational tools that we adults develop. And that's important uh, because how we, we teach kids with technology is pretty old school, frankly. And historically, edu education technologies that I see, a lot of them are really based off the old models of lecture and consumption and directive learning. And that needs to change, and in fact, it's starting to change. Because our digital natives are creating and designing products for themselves to teach. And we can really learn from that. Um, and I see the, the best players um, who are doing this well and creating the right tools for kids are putting a high priority on user research. They really work with kids and listen to kids. And that the innovation in their uh, products is a reflection of that intense listening uh, and partnership with kids. Um, at, at my company, we've seen that with some really neat things we did where we let kids around the world in partnership with the Smithsonian make their own sort of micro documentaries about their cultures and share them online. And you know, you can go online and check out you know, 100 places around the world where kids are talking about their own technology. And there we had to have a balance of scaffolding and curriculum and moderation, um, but also the freedom for kids to interpret their own experience as they see fit, which is really what makes it powerful. And that teaches us a thing or two as well. So I guess what I'm really saying is kids have this butter thing nailed. <laughs> and that, in the, at the end of the day, when that's happening, that's what makes me very optimistic. And I think we really need to get one thing right in this endeavor. And that's this, let's make our work not only the work of protection, but also the engine of production for the next generation. Let's celebrate what they made. Let's celebrate what they're creating. And let's learn from what they're teaching. Thank you. <laughs>